let's give a warm back and warm welcome to Lisa Huchman. Thank you so much. I tell you, I can forecast the weather, but I can't forecast exactly what our traffic situation is going to be here. It took me 15 minutes to park. 15 minutes. I parked at the Ambassador and I walked all this way over. But thank you guys so much for having me out today. It is definitely an honor. Today is um, it, it's a little bit of a somber occasion in our family because it also marks one year since my great uncle Doug passed away. And my great uncle Doug is greatly important to the reason why I am standing here and also to how we stay safe when it comes to storm spotters. And I'm going to take you back many, many decades. I'm going to take you back to World War II. During World War II, we had this great invention known as radar. We loved using that radar. What was that reason why we were using it? It was because we were using it to take a look at the enemy planes as they were coming in. But there was something that kept popping up on that radar that frustrated those radar technicians. Do you know what it was? It was rain. It was rain. But we used that to our benefit and technology that we have continued to advance over the decades. But back in the 1940s, the 1950s, and it actually started in 1938, those of us who were forecasters with the Weather Bureau, it is now rebranded the National Weather Service, or you had forecasters that were on TV, we were forbidden from saying the word tornado. We could not say it on TV. A lot of those forecasters in their weather briefings, they wouldn't use the word tornado because the government thought that we were going to create panic by using that term. Now, I cannot imagine myself getting on TV and not saying the word tornado. We talk about tornado safety with kids in all the different schools that we visit. And of course, we get on TV and tell you about tornado warnings. We are coming up on the 50th anniversary of how we changed tornado warnings that you guys also see on TV. And one of my mentors and great friends, Mike Smith, had a lot to do with that. And we're going to talk about that too. In the 1950s, coming out of World War II, we had several notable and deadly tornadoes that occurred in Kansas. We actually had the anniversary a few days ago, May 25th, 1955. It was the day of the Udall tornado. That tornado struck at about 1030 at night, came up from the south. It was one of those tornadoes that tracked from the south to the north. And tornadoes will track any way that they want to. I've seen storms where the tornadoes will be produced from the southwest to the northeast, from the west to the east. I've even seen tornadoes form from the storms moving from the northwest down to the southeast. But rarely will you get a tornado that will go from east to west. Because if you look at the pattern and all the winds and how they're positioned across the whole entire world, here in Kansas, our predominant wind flow is from the west. That's why our storm systems come in from the west and they exit off to the east. Well, back in 1955, again, you have folks that are not saying the word tornado, but we had a day where those forecasters knew that we were going to have severe weather. And the folks in Udall that evening, they thought the coast was clear. Mary Taylor, who was the telephone operator that night, if she had not gone into work that evening, she probably would have survived that tornado. Her house was one of the very few that still stood on the northwest side of Udall after that tornado came through that night. That tornado uh, developed on the Oklahoma side of things, hit Blackwell, Oklahoma, and continued to track to the north, struck a farmhouse in Oxford. I believe that family lost four of their children in that tornado that night. Then the tornado continued to move up toward Udall. Went hit Udall, most of the town completely wiped out. The tornado then went up to Rock, and then for whatever reason over toward Rock, it made a hard right turn and avoided hitting the town of Rock. If you were to take a look at that storm, and radar was done much differently in the 1950s than it is now. Now we don't have to sit into a darkened room and watch this green sweep move across the screen and use tracing paper and trace those storms. I'm old enough that I remember what that was like at the National Weather Service because I remember Dick Elder, who was the meteorologist in charge. One time I went to the National Weather Service over on the west side of town out by the airport and he gave me a grease pencil and he said, here kiddo, go to town. Because what they used to do is they would take that tracing paper, they would put it on the radar and they would draw that storm and they would follow the path of that storm. If you were to take this storm, the Udall storm, 
take the Greensburg storm, put them on top of each other, it's the same storm. It was the same tornado. So that puts it in the perspective of just how big, how monstrous that Udall tornado was in 1955. Pretty much everybody in town lost at least one family member and many family members within one family. Um, after that tornado, the town of Udall, they wanted to build back and they wanted to build back even stronger. They didn't wanna lose folks to other communities that were blowing up. At this time, K-15 had already been finished. So you had an easy access that you could get going into Derby all the way up toward Wichita. They didn't wanna lose people to other places like Wellington, Ark City, Winfield, which could have easily happened. So the town actually created a warning way for all of their community members. Gerald Hoffman, who has since passed on, he worked for the telephone company. And he created a warning that would go from one telephone to another to another. But in addition to that, the folks in Udall were some of our first storm spotters. They built an outlook tower. And that outlook tower in the 1950s served two purposes. Number one, every single plane that flew overhead, they were writing down that plane. What kind of plane it was? What time was it? Because in the 1950s, it was a different era. It was a different world coming out of World War II. And if you back up a few years, back to 1952, President Truman put all of these sirens across the country because he looked at it as if we use the atomic bomb, that technology on another country, they could use that technology on us. So we wanted to make sure that Americans were protected, that Americans were safe. So that's how all these air raid sirens went in across the country. Today, they are our tornado warning devices. So how did you get from an air raid siren to a tornado warning device? It actually happened in the 1950s, and it happened right here in Wichita, Kansas. So after the Udall tornado, you have your first storm spotters. 1957, we had another horrible tornado disaster up in the Kansas City area known as the Ruskin Heights tornado. That tornado began on the Kansas side, and unfortunately, it killed a lot of people in the Kansas City metro. And Mike Smith, he was about knee-high to a prairie dog at that time that that tornado hit. I'll tell you, Mike, he was, he was already out, you know, offering up weather forecasts. I think he was selling weather forecasts to his neighbors for about a nickel apiece. But his family, mm -hmm, it was the beginning stages of being an entrepreneur right there. But in 1957, his family owned a, um, a Ford dealership up in Kansas City. So they were actually taking brand new vehicles off the showroom floor and transporting people to the hospital. So that's one of the first big tornado experiences that Mike Smith remembers. But then the following year, we had the El Dorado tornado. And if you go over to El Dorado, they have the monument that, that remembers the people that died in that tornado. The day after that, it changed how we use those air raid sirens and turn them into tornado warning devices. A sergeant with the Wichita Police Department by the name of Paul Hansen, he was out storm spotting one evening and he saw a tornado somewhere near Kellogg and Rock, Kellogg and Webb, Greenwich, somewhere over there. And he tried to get a hold of all of his managers, all of his superiors, but nobody would pick up. So he called the city manager, city manager wasn't there. So what is he gonna do? He actually flipped on that siren, and to this day, that is the first world use of a tornado warning device, and it happened right here in Wichita, Kansas. But still in 1958, it's still taboo for us to say tornado in the TV world. You go through the 1960s, and something else was changing in the 1960s. Also, after World War II, you had two brothers, two brothers that were among 13 that were born on a farm in Lamont, Oklahoma. Two, one of those brothers was my grandfather, Harold Teachman Sr., and then also my great uncle Doug. They left the farm because it just wasn't great. You really couldn't make a, a fortune on the farm. They heard about the booming aircraft industry up here in Wichita, so they moved up this way. And both of those brothers settled in Hayesville, and that's where they decided to raise their families. But also in the 1960s and 70s, my grandpa and my great uncle Doug did two things. Number one, they became amateur radio folks. Do any of, are any of you amateur radio operators in here? Raise your hand. We always try to get encouraging 
the next generation to get into the ham radio, get into ham radio, because ham radio is still such a useful device that we use to this day and will continue to use. Because if a tornado comes through, your phone, your cell phone will be useless. But do you know who will help set up communications for your family, for your hometown? It will be amateur radio storm spotters. And my family has done that for decades. Grandpa and my Uncle Doug, they became amateur radio storm spotters. And one of the last things that Uncle Doug ever said to me before he passed away last year is, Lisa, I want you to know that your grandpa and I were some of the first storm spotters in the Wichita area. We were the originals. So in 1970, after more tornadoes that we had in the 1960s, and one of the most notable ones was the Topeka tornado of 1966. Everybody said, well, Burnett's Mound, you know, that's going to protect Topeka. Topeka is going to be fine. We're never going to have to worry about a tornado. Well, tornadoes are going to go any place. They're going to develop at any time if all the right ingredients come together. Doesn't care. Doesn't care. I hear that all the time. People say the keeper of the plains will protect Wichita. It's the confluence of the little Arkansas and the big Arkansas River. Because of that, Wichita will never be hit. No, one day it will probably happen because that happened in Topeka. That tornado came right over that mound. And if you were to take modern day inflation, factor that in, the Topeka 1966 tornado is probably one of the costliest tornadoes in all of American history, still to this day. And we've had, we've had quite a few that we could talk about in the last 10 years alone, right? Yeah, we definitely could. Well, in 1970, my dad graduated from campus high school. My dad wanted to go to Vietnam. His, uh, his army recruiter that he was going to sign up with, Mr. Birmingham, was best friends with my grandpa. My dad shows up at the army recruiting office Mr. Birmingham never shows up. So my dad says, forget this. Goes next door and he enlists in the Marine Corps. <laughs> my dad says, send me to Vietnam. Send me to Vietnam. They send him to New Jersey instead. <laughs> but it was all meant to be. Because in New Jersey, he met my mom. And my mom passed away five days before Christmas last year. This year, in about another week, will be their 50th wedding anniversary. They got married on June 8, 1974. That's notable because that is the day that we changed how we do tornado warnings on TV. And that is largely in part because of Mike Smith. Now, I'm glad that my parents had that wedding and that reception in New Jersey because had that been here in Wichita, I bet you that would have been really wild because we had a tornado outbreak that went from the Oklahoma City metro up toward Emporia. Multiple tornadoes breaking out from Kansas into Oklahoma. The Oklahoma City metro picking up six tornadoes on that day. Six tornadoes. Not one person killed. June 8th, 1974. The meteorologist that was at the helm at WKY-TV in Oklahoma City, WKY is now KFOR, which is, I'm proud to say, our sister station within the Next Star family. So I know many of the meteorologists down in Oklahoma City quite well, and especially at KFOR since they're our sister station. Well, a gentleman by the name of Frank Maggot heard about what a great job Mike Smith did in Oklahoma City. And Frank Maggot owned a big TV consulting firm. They, they still exist to this day, where they'll go in, they'll take a look at all the stuff that you're doing on TV, they'll take a look at your talent, and they'll tell you the things that you can work on, the things that you can grow, the things that you can improve. Frank was so impressed with what Mike had done, he hopped on a plane, flew down to Oklahoma City, and said, Mike, teach me how you did these tornado warnings because I want to use that and teach all of these other TV stations across the whole entire country how to do it. And Mike did. And then Mike later left Oklahoma City, came up to Wichita, late 70s through the early 90s. My mentor, Dave Freeman, and I also consider Mike a mentor too, but my mentor is Dave Freeman who came on board in 1992 and he retired in 2017 because Dave took me under his wing when I was 16 years old. I started interning at KSN when I was 16. I was a junior in high school. But if you were to ask my mom growing up, 
that this woman would grow up to be the first female chief meteorologist in the Wichita TV market, she would have laughed at you because I was scared to death of storms. I was scared to death. Well, my dad's next tour of duty in the Marine Corps after my parents got married in 74 was someplace overseas, someplace that my mom could not go to, and they wanted to have rugrats. So my, as the saying goes in the Marine Corps, if we wanted you to have a wife, we would issue you a wife. <laughs> That's what my dad says. And so he got out into the reserves, and he came back this way. Now, my dad, he has traveled all across the whole entire world. My dad worked in the aircraft industry for 45 years, largely with Cessna, which is now Textron. He spent two years, two years on Air Force One when it was at Boeing. And I'm proud to say that they're still flying the plane that my dad helped build in the early 90s. So when I see our president on that plane, I'm like, oh, yeah, my dad had a part in building that plane, which that plane is going to be retired here shortly. Um, but it was definitely a sight to be seen. As a little kid in fifth and sixth grade getting to walk on Air Force One that you know that the president is going to be on, that was pretty cool really, really cool. And all of the family members got to go through. It was before they did the paint job. It still looked green. They put all the interior in. It was just, it was just wild for a little girl from Hayesville, Kansas to see something like that. But um, my dad, when he came back this way, my dad always said that I've traveled the whole entire world and there is no better place to live and to raise your children than in Wichita, Kansas. My dad grew up in Hayesville. He could tell you stories of where he used to swim, the things that he and his sisters used to do back in the 50s and the 60s. And I love it whenever I get to hear those stories. My dad brought my mom back. And I think my mom would even tell you that she was more of a Kansan than she was a girl who was born in New York City and raised in Freehold, New Jersey. Those of you that know Bruce Springsteen, that's where, that's where Bruce Springsteen is from, Freehold, New Jersey. I think he graduated with my uncle. But um, my mom was really proud of being a Kansan and, and living around here. Um, but through the 80s, I, I really didn't have that many experiences with severe weather. My dad would, be a, would sign up and become a storm spotter with his amateur radio network, just like Grandpa did. So any time through the 80s, in the 90s that a severe thunderstorm warning or a tornado warning were issued for Sedgwick County, my dad was out. My dad would clock out of work, he would hop into his car, he would go someplace in the county, and he would relay that information back to my grandpa, because grandpa was the radio officer. He would sit in his ham shack and he would have a map of Sedgwick County and he would have all of his storm spotters positioned just watching that relaying that information back to those that would then pass the information on to media and get the word out of what these thunderstorms were doing. My sister is also an amateur radio storm spotter. So my dad and my sister were always out. Mom was stuck with the kid that would hyperventilate all the time. Anytime that the thunder would roar, anytime that those tornado sirens would go off, I used to hyperventilate. I, I, I couldn't catch my breath. Mom didn't know whether to give me a tranquilizer or to smack this kid, I'll be honest with you. But she was really surprised that I would turn my direction to become a meteorologist, which happened in the 90s. The first tornado that I remember as a kid was the Heston tornado. It was March of 1990. And I was outside. It was after school back then. And I always tell the kids nowadays, you know, you, you guys have it so easy. You guys on your phone, you can just, you could just squeeze a little button and say, play so-and-so. Well, back then I had something known as a tape cassette and I put it inside of a boom box. Boom box? What's a boom box? The one that only had one speaker because two speakers were pretty expensive in the early 90s, okay? I remember I was outside, I was jumping rope, and the northern sky was jet black for hours. I was listening to Lisa Lisa and the Colt Jam, the song, Ooh, Baby, I Think I Love You from head to toe. That's what I was listening to. And then the tornado sirens started to go off. And then the Hayesville Police Department flipped on their sirens, and I swear they were driving up and down those streets 70 or 80 miles an hour. And I think that's where the storm anxiety for me started. The house that we grew up in off Hungerford in Hayesville didn't have a basement. 
So I would run inside and I'd say, mom, mom, let's go to grandma. Let's go to grandma's. Be Why did I want to go to grandma's? She had the basement. That day I didn't get to go, but on April 26, 1991, I did. That was the first tornado that hit Hayesville. We suffered two tornado disasters within 10 years time. April 26, 1991, the tornado developed farther to the southwest, really started to get its act together once it hit the Valley Center floodway and it hit the far northwest side of Hayesville. If you go to Hayesville at the intersection of Willow Lane and Meridian, all those homes have been rebuilt since the 91 tornado. The tornado continued to grow at 55th and Seneca, hit Cox Farm, hit McConnell Air Force Base, and then it grew more than a mile wide when it hit Andover. Everybody says it's the Andover tornado. No, no, no. Those of us from Hayesville will correct you, and we will say that it is the Hayesville, Southeast Wichita, and Andover tornado because it impacted all of us. Well, that night, a few hours afterwards, my dad came back with my sister, and my dad was out storm spotting near Freeman Elementary with my sister. And I think that's also the reason why my dad insisted that when my sister and I started to drive that we had at least a six cylinder. Because if you're gonna get out of the way of a tornado, you need to make sure you can put the pedal to the metal and a four cylinder back then wouldn't have cut it. You would have been like, put the pedal to the metal. You're like, uh, uh. give me a few seconds there to accelerate there. Um, but they got out of the path of the tornado and my those that are storm spotters, they take hail damage, they take damage to their vehicles that nobody covers, except for themselves. And my dad drew, drove over power lines to get to folks that were flipped over in a Jeep that wanted to make sure that they were okay, and they were. Hours later, I remember walking through the damage path with my dad and my sister, seeing broken glass all over the ground, insulation that was woven in with the grass, and the homes that were not the way I recognized them anymore. And I also saw kids that I went to school with that were crying, hugging their mom or their dad because they lost everything. In fifth grade, and actually a year before that in fourth grade, it was almost like the universe was saying, Lisa, this is what you need to do. This is what you're meant to do. This is your destiny. And in fourth grade, my reading teacher at Rex Elementary assigned all of us to do a newscast. Guess who the meteorologist was? It's me. A couple weeks after the April 26, 1991 tornado, only two students from Freeman Elementary were given the opportunity to tour KSN. Guess who one of those students was? It was me. And I got to meet Mike Smith for the first time. And that was when Mike had his, his um, private weather forecasting company called Weather Data. And where my office is now is actually where Weather Data was in 1991. And I was so excited to show off this t-shirt that my mom got me for this trip. The t-shirt had a big old tornado on it. And do you know what it said? Toto, I think we're back in Kansas. <laughs> but again, I think that was the universe saying, this is what you need to do. This is what you need to do. And I think we all learn as life goes on that life will take you in different ways, different directions. And sometimes God's going to put a bone out there for you. And I think he's just going to wait and he's going to see if you pick that bone up and you roll with it and you go with it. And I wasn't prepared for that at that time. I was still scared of storms. But I think that being scared of storms was a little bit of curiosity. I think it was also adrenaline that was running through my system. Because my sophomore year at Campus High School, I took a drafting class. I thought I was going to be an architect. I love drawing houses, and I even won a competition for drawing a house. But I took a drafting class, and on day one, I hated it. I realized this is not for me. It was the most stressful class ever. And then that summer, I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? I know I want to go to college. What am I going to do? And um, I loved science. I loved mathematics. I loved watching the news on TV through the 80s and the 90s. And still to this day, if you look at our station, you look at Channel 10, you look at Channel 12, if you have been to other parts of the country, you realize how great our news is here in Wichita. There is something, there's a difference between quality and quantity. I've worked in markets, it's all about quantity. How many stories can you get in that first A block? Here in Wichita, we have quality. You have 
reporters, you have anchors that are going out in our communities and, and digging for those details, like Jackie over here. Jackie's shooting some video over here. She's, uh, she's one of our new additions over to KSN, and she's learning. She's learning from, from those of us that have been in the business for quite a while, and she's continuing to grow, and she's going to do awesome things in our business. Um, but I never thought that I was good enough or pretty enough to be on TV. I thought, this is something that is just way far out there, something that I cannot obtain. My mom growing up through the 1960s and graduating in 70 as well, back then women were only expected to do one of four different things. Yeah, you guys are laughing because you know what I'm going to talk about. It's a homewrecker, it is a secretary, a teacher, and a nurse. All four hardworking jobs. But those were the areas that women were expected to gravitate towards. My mom wanted to be a nurse. She did. But she had somebody tell her, you know what, you stink at chemistry. You have no business being a nurse. And that really squashed her dreams. And she said to herself, if I ever have kids, I am never going to let anybody or anything stand in their way. If they have dreams, I'm going to let them go for it and I'm going to let them achieve it. Well, my mom decided that she was going to be a secretary. She put herself through secretarial school on her own because we come from an Eastern European family on my mom's side. My grandmother immigrated from Czechoslovakia by herself when she was 14 years old. She had to be sponsored here in America. So her sister was already here in New York City. So my grandma was like, well, I'll just be her nanny. And so that's how she was able to come over this way. And she married, she married her first husband. He died in World War II. Her second husband is my grandpa. And my grandpa, Mike, his parents were both born and raised in Czechoslovakia, and they came over to America, but he was born in Virginia, so he was born here in America. And um, so my mom, coming from an Eastern European family, all the money for school went to the boy in the family because the boy was going to carry on the family name. So my mom put herself all the way through secretarial school. Well, when my mom and dad had kids, they had two girls. And I'm actually the funny one in the family. My sister is the smart one. My sister graduated from Friends, majored in biology, minored in chemistry. She worked three jobs while she was going through college, working overnights, processing checks at Interest Bank. And she went on to get her PhD, and she works at the CDC. She loves to study viruses. She used to have pictures of viruses on our, our wall because my sister and I shared a room growing up. So she likes to call herself a floozy. Get it? Floozy? Ha ha. Like I said, I'm the funny one. No, she actually created that joke. I got to give all credit to her on that. Um, but I always thought she was going to be the meteorologist in the family. And I said to her one time, I said, how come you're not the meteorologist and why am I the meteorologist? And she said, well, because I didn't think it would pay. <laughs> so I thought, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and chase this dream. I'm going to just give it a try. S see what happens, right? So I write to all three chief meteorologists in town here in Wichita, and I get to spend one day with Ben Pringle at Channel 10. He was the chief before Jay Prater uh, is now, and I loved it. I absolutely loved it. And then a month later, I think it was divine intervention where God said, you know what, this is what you need to do. Got a letter in the mail from Dave Freeman that said, come in with your guidance counselor. We'll get you signed up for an internship. And that's what's been great about the Hayesville school system because I did not have one teacher, I did not have anybody that stood in my way. My junior counselor actually drove me to KSN for my interview. How cool is that? And with getting credit, I was able to start interning while I was 16 years old, junior year, senior year. When it came up time for college, I was deciding, what am I going to do? I actually had my heart set on going to OU, but I think my dad would have disowned me. You want to know why? My dad's an Oklahoma State fan. Oh, that could have, that could have, ooh, that could have caused some tension, right? But also, you didn't get the broadcasting part until your senior year, and they've since changed their program at OU. It's, it's much more accommodating for those that want to go into broadcasting. And one afternoon, I was forecasting with Dave, and Dave stopped what he was doing, and he looked at me, and he said, you know, kiddo, and to this day, he still calls me kiddo. He said, I want to tell you about this program with Mississippi State. It's the program that I went through. You could go to school at Wichita State, and you could go to school at Mississippi State. 
Well, we had something in the weather lab, which is now the Storm Track 3 Weather Center. Um, we called it the Overachievers Club, and I wanted to be an overachiever. So I actually double majored. I was on academic scholarship to Wichita State, got my BA in communication, and at the same time I got my BS in geosciences with the emphasis in broadcast meteorology from Mississippi State University. Two degrees, two universities within four years' time. I was taking 18 to 22 credit hours every single semester. I was working full time at the Derby Walmart and I was interning one day a week at KSN. So I'm never going back to school ever again. <laughs> done, I am done. But also my senior year, um, September 11th happened. And things really changed in the broadcast industry. Jobs dried up. It was hard to get your first full time job back at that time right out of the gate. And working in a market like Wichita, you don't do that right out of college. Because Wichita is known as the severe weather Super Bowl of the whole entire world. It's up there with Oklahoma City, Dallas, Kansas City, Omaha, St. Louis, Denver. We get a lot of weather here that keeps us constantly on our toes, which I like to call job security. My, uh, my husband and I, we got married about a month after I graduated college. My husband served a mission with our faith in Romania for a couple of years, which actually put him behind. He was also on full academic ride for electrical engineering at Wichita State, and I had to pull him away from it to get my first full-time job. But it also took me about a, a year after I graduated college before I got that job. Because a lot of people don't realize that when you get out into the broadcasting world right out of college, you get paid less than a teacher does. And teachers do not get paid nearly enough at all. And that's also the reason why, and you mentioned this, I, I moved around from place to place to place. Because we do that in our business for a couple of different reasons. Number one, to increase your pay. Number two, to move closer to family. And, um, and to work your way up for different positions. I've worked weekend mornings. I've worked weekend evenings. I've worked weekday mornings. And now I am the chief. But that becoming chief did not happen overnight. It took many, many years. It took more than a decade before I finally got there. And I had the door slammed in my face a lot of times for different reasons. Well, we don't like your eyes. No, we want to have a blonde. We don't want to have a brunette. Oh, yeah. And other things that I may not necessarily have that other women have help to push them along in, in our industry. So the first job offer that I had was in Joplin, Missouri. And my husband could not continue his education down there in electrical engineering. Next opportunity was Lincoln, Nebraska. That didn't work out. And then finally, West Virginia came along at WSAZ. And WSAZ is a powerhouse in the Huntington, Charleston, West Virginia market. And my husband went to WVU Tech, where he finished with his degree in electrical engineering. But also, WSAZ is a station that Dave Freeman also worked at in his career. Yeah. It was the station that he realized, I don't want to do sports anymore, and I want to become a meteorologist. Because the meteorologist got sick on her dinner break one night, and the news director looked at Dave and said, you're going to get up and do weather tonight at 10 o'clock. Do weather? I've never done weather before. Too bad. Learn it. And so Dave got up there, and as he, as he told, tells it, um, he got up there and he just started having such a blast. He started having such a fun time. And he says, I think I went over longer than I was supposed to. But that's when he realized, I want to go back to school at Mississippi State, which he did the correspondence program like I did, and furthered his education in meteorology. Went to work in Dayton, and then he came over here to Wichita, where he had a, a wonderful, wonderful career. Um, after in West Virginia for a couple of years, we didn't want to stay there. We both got jobs across the mountains in, uh, in Maryland. I worked in Baltimore, but my husband worked in Fairfax, Virginia. This was from 2005 to 2007. Gas was approaching $5 a gallon. And if you've ever been on the Capitol Beltway, if you sneeze, a semi overturns. And it's just stop and go traffic. If you are not to your destination by 6 a.m., Good luck. It's going to take you probably a couple of hours to get there. And on a good day, my husband had an hour and a half commute each way. That was no life for us to live. It really wasn't. And we're Midwest folks. We wanted to get back closer to family. We did. And I think Ross tried to hire me a time or two over at Channel 12, but my husband couldn't find a job here. 
And we've always, with our goal in mind, to be able to have the career going for both of us. And it worked out. We went to work in uh, Kansas City. My husband went to work at Garmin, and my husband still works for Garmin International as a software engineer. And um, I went to work at KMBC. And at KMBC, I did a lot of storm chasing. And I can tell you some stories about some scary experiences with storm chasing. But I also believe because of my past and my family history of storm spotting, which storm spotting and storm chasing are different. Storm spotting, you're going to a place, you're sitting there, and you're passing on that information to somebody else in command. Whereas a storm chaser, you're actually following that storm. And so I was a storm chaser at KMBC. First time, and my dad always warned me. He said, Lisa, when you're sitting in that vehicle, always protect your face because you need to be prepared for that window to blow in. I remember we were chasing somewhere either in Chase or Marion counties. I had multiple strikes against me. Number one, it was after dark. And if you are chasing after dark, you have to use your senses. You have to use your eyes for every single flash of lightning to look at that horizon to see, do I see a wall cloud? Do I see a funnel? Do I see a tornado? What's going on at that horizon? Number two, you also have to hear your, use, use your ears. Roll down that window. Listen to that storm. Are you hearing a roar with it? Well, that storm decided to build back right on top of us. There's strike number two. Strike number three, we were on a dirt road. Strike number four, we were getting hit with tons of wind, tons of hail, and I lost my radar connection. At that time, it is so easy now, you can download Radar Scope or Free Storm Track 3 Weather App, and it can show you your location in relation to where these storms are. But back then, you had a laptop and you had an air card that you would punch in and you hoped and you prayed that you had a cell phone signal. Well, usually once you got past Gardner at that time, Gardner, Kansas, you had no cell phone signal. So I had nothing. I had no radar to gauge what was happening with me. And here I was sitting in the passenger seat and we always have two people chasing at one time. One for the eyes on the road, the other one for the eye on the sky and the radar, working together as a team. So here I was over in the passenger seat like this. Because of so much wind, so much hail, I didn't know what was about ready to come our way. And it felt like an eternity before our vehicle got turned around. And my photojournalist that I trusted, that I had chased with all the time, Mark Lee, once we finally got back on pavement, he said to me, Lisa, I didn't want to freak you out, but our car was moving and my foot was not on the accelerator. <laughs> Yeah. Life lesson number one. Life lesson number two. Harveyville, Kansas, hit by a tornado. How many of you know where Harveyville is? Raise your hand. Ooh, nobody? It's a small community near Topeka. And a tornado came through, struck at 9.01 p.m. on the southwest side, and it went right up through the town. One person died. He died as he was going to his storm shelter, his cellar, and his house collapsed on him. Well, we finally got a tour through town, and it was about 12.30 in the morning. It was so cold. I wasn't prepared for that. I was shivering. My, my photojournalist had some thin coat, which helped. But we got a guided tour at about 12.15, 12.30 in the morning, and I was so glad that we had the sheriff's deputy with us. It was our station from Kansas City, another station from Kansas City, another station from Kansas City, and uh, Topeka. And we're walking up this road, and you have your camera in one hand, and the camera is now that our photojournalists use are a lot smaller than they used to be about 10, 15 years ago. Camera in one hand, light on, tripod in the other, because they always balance themselves out because you don't want to have all that weight on one side because it's not good for you. So here we are walking as a convoy, come up to this beautiful 1905 Kansas farmhouse. Top floor, gone. Whole bunch of stuff in the front yard. This gentleman comes out of the house. He's walking up to us. And he's walking faster and faster and faster. All of a sudden, the sheriff's deputy stops. He turns around and says, I don't want you guys to say anything. I don't want you to do anything because I need to go talk to this guy right now. Sheriff's deputy goes up, talks to the gentleman. They exchange a few words. Gentleman goes back into his house. Sheriff's deputy comes back to us. And do you know what he says? That guy had a gun and he was prepared to shoot. Sure enough, he had a 38 revolver in his hand. We went frame by frame by frame because my photojournalist was smart and was recording on this. And we saw, we saw the gun. 
He thought we were looters. That taught me life lesson number two when you're storm chasing and someplace gets hit, have your head on a swivel because you do not know what is going to go on in somebody's mind after that happens. Look at it from his perspective. It's 1230 in the morning. There's no electricity in your town. And you're seeing all these people with flashlights that are holding stuff. What's going to go through your mind? Well, the guy was a nice guy. I interviewed him in his living room. I'm a Kansas girl, so it, it, you know, it, it didn't bother me at all. Um, but after a while, after working at KMBC for six and a half years, for whatever reason, my contract was not renewed. And I was devastated. And sometimes that will happen. And Dave used to tell me that all the time. And he prepared me for that even when I was 16 years old. He said, kiddo, you ain't been in this business until you've been fired at least once. <laughs> but, don't, you know, I never found out the reason why. Um, they just say we want to go in a different direction. And you know what the answer to that is, a different direction from you. But I also believe, because I don't think the situation was a great working situation for me. I don't. And I do believe that if God puts you in something, if you don't remove yourself from it, he's going to remove you for you. And he did that for me. We did not want to pick up and move someplace else. I interviewed in St. Louis. I interviewed in Orlando. But my family was right here in Wichita, Kansas. I remember, so what, what the company did with me was they gave me a three-month extension. We want to use these next three months to see what else is out there. And we think you should do the same thing. Then I got a two-month extension. Same thing. One-month extension, and then they said, you're done. I remember before I signed on for that first three-month extension, I drove on 69 Highway out of um, Stanley, Stillwell, Kansas. And I was just so upset because my work ethic will work circles around anybody, anybody. And I said a prayer and I said, God, please give me the strength to walk in there and face these people that clearly want me to take my marbles and go someplace else. As soon as I said amen, a black sedan with a personalized Kansas license plate passed me. What was on that license plate? Meant to be. M-I-N-T to B-E. And then I passed the car, then the car passed me. It was almost like God was saying, do you see this beacon right here, kiddo? Because this is happening for a reason. Went on an employment for a couple of months. Two and a half months later, I wound up at the competition in Kansas City with an even better role working weekday mornings. But that was only a placeholder. All these places that I worked at, from West Virginia to Baltimore, to both of those stations in Kansas City, were preparing me for what would happen in 2017. Got a call one February afternoon from Dave. And Dave said, kiddo, in five days, I'm going to announce my retirement. And nothing would please me more if you could come back and fill my shoes as the first female chief meteorologist in the Wichita market. Can you do it? Can you come back and build your legacy? I moved heaven and high water with two lawyers to get out of my contract in Kansas City so I could be with y'all today. And I'm glad that I did it. If you were to look at all the females that are chief meteorologists across this country, we only make up 8%. I am part of the 8%. And to be in Wichita, Kansas, like I said, Wichita, Kansas, you got to know your stuff. And if you were to look at all the meteorologists, we have two females in the weather department, me and meteorologist Lucy Dahl. We only make up 29% of all those that are on TV. So, yeah, females being 29% of the overall, but 8% are chief meteorologists. Lucy and I have an interesting connection because it's always six degrees of separation, right? Two minutes, six degrees of separation. And her mentor is actually my mentee. When I worked in Kansas City, my mentee, Mac, Matt Bethwith, is actually her mentor when she went to Mizzou. She used to watch my weather forecast when she was in college. He made her watch mine. Yeah. Well, this year marks seven years that I have been chief here in Wichita, and I am pleased as punch. I'm having a blast, and this is where I hope to live out the rest of my career. Thank you guys for having me, and I'm sure you guys have some questions. Sure. Well, I've told you this privately, eye to eye, 
probably going to do a month ago or whatever, but I just want to say, you are the most professional, most concise, most knowledgeable. Thank you. The best. I mean, I've been back, I, I've been around since Meryl Terrell, and I'm 67 years old, and hands down, I mean, hands down and above and beyond, you are the best weather person ever. I mean, Thank you. You get right to the point, you get you know, no fluff, no nothing, and your knowledge is just unbelievable. But what I like about it is you get right to the point, you get all the facts out, and you do it in a timely manner, and you, you just don't draw it out. You know? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Although my producers might argue with you, they're like, man, she always keeps talking too long. She always goes over. <laughs> But thank you, thank you very much. And you know, growing up in the '80s, you had um, Jim O'Donnell, Merrill, Mike Smith, all incredible folks doing the weather for us. And then the '90s, Merrill continuing, and then Dave, and and uh, you know, then you have Ben Pringle as as Jim O'Donnell retires, and then you've got Jay. I mean, everybody thinks, is it like Anchorman? Are you guys all like ready for a brawl? out in the alley kind of a thing. No, we're all friends. We all have the same goals in mind, and that's to protect lives and to protect property. Hey, Liz, thanks for coming to speak with us. Thank you. I want to be a meteorologist, and I told Mike Smith once that that's what I was going to do, but I decided to become an engineer, so it's probably a good financial move. That's true. This is true. That's, and that's also what my sister said, too, um, where she said, I didn't think it would pay. And then I look at her and I said, yeah, you're going to have that pension from the government when you retire, aren't you? I was watching the qualifying for Indy 500 a couple of weeks ago and I'm saying, uh, Lucy, and I couldn't believe how a person could keep talking without taking a breath for so long. Yep. And, and that's, that's very incredible. And you came on afterwards and just picked up. Mm -hmm. I thought you guys were going to pass up because you had a <laughs> And you just kept talking and talking and talking. I was just really, really do you have to practice that? Well, that was actually part of my practice as an intern. What Dave used to do was he would put us up in front of the chroma key. We would have intern coaching sessions, and he would say, all right, get up there, do the weather. Okay, now you're going to do the weather again, but this time I'm going to stop you and tell you everything that you're doing wrong. But I think I had such a great mentor in Dave that really helped to prepare me, and then all these other places that I've worked along the way. I mean, this year, I mean, uh, if you were to add up my internship, I'm coming up to almost 30 years in the broadcast industry. It's, it's been a while. It really has been. Broadcasting industry has changed a lot. You know, we've got digital now, but, uh, but I think there's still going to be room for growth. And of course, in these type of places where we always get severe weather, we're always going to stay busy. I'm now in MCS season, which is almost like the last severe episode that we had that ended our chances for tornadoes. Now we still have some tornadoes with embedded thunderstorms coming in from eastern Colorado at night. Yes. I'm just curious, what what is the standard for interrupting sporting events? <laughs> and how serious does it have to get for us to have a have a sporting event interrupted? It seems like yeah. it's you know it's kind of wishy-washy and basically if, it, if there's a drop of rain sometimes. Not us, not us. I will tell you that. Um, it, it just kind of depends on what your rules are. And our rules are, of course, if we have a tornado warning, I'm going to try to get on air as fast as possible. I will look at who is going to be in the path of that tornado. Is it something that, you know, do I have just a few minutes until I get to a network break? Can I take that network break as opposed to stepping on programming? Um, but I mean, if we have a tornado that's coming into Winona or coming into Kingman, coming into Wichita, we're going to hop on immediately. And depending on how things are looking with that storm, if that storm decides to ramp back down, then we'll try to get off as soon as possible. It is literally on a case-by-case -case situation with that. I know that there are, I mean, yours is obviously sports, but I know there are two other sacred programs that you don't interrupt. Jeopardy, Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> I've interrupted both. Um, there was one time we had a tornado that was, it was the Ensign tornado shortly after I got to KSM. And um, we were getting the pictures, we were getting confirmation of it, in addition to a strong signature on radar that was holding together. And so I popped on air before, a few minutes before a five o'clock broadcast, and that was on Final Jeopardy. And this, and I was like, I've got a tornado, I have a tornado that's coming into Dodge City. You know, we gotta get people to their safe place. I wish that the technology was there that I could break away from your TV 
and your TV and just the people that are in the path of that. We used to be able to do that because we have transmitters all over Kansas. Y'all don't realize this, but I cover nearly 80 counties over three states and two time zones. So we could have partly cloudy skies here, no problems, but I have a tornado that's going into Goodland. Well, Goodland is in my viewing area. I can't break that up due to satellites. I can't do that. I can't just hop on our Oberlin transmitter and only appear on those folks there. I wish that that was possible. I wish. In addition to your great technical expertise, you have a coachiness that I love. Would you talk about our fur babies? Mm hmm And our neck of the woods. Yep, yep. And to add to that, when I was working in West Virginia, we had a consultant that came in. And he was working with me the first time. All of a sudden, he stopped. He looked at me, and he says, Lisa, lose your accent. What accent? I don't have an accent. Oh, you have an accent. And some people that come into my office, like um, meteorologist Jack Boston, who is originally from, you know, he's worked in uh, Wisconsin. He's worked in New York. He's, he's, he's worked in all these other places in addition to uh, AccuWeather here before coming on board with us. And he says, yeah, I noticed it too. It was almost like it was a southern Oklahoma, northern Texas accent. And um, I remember him saying that to me. And he says, you know, you will never work in New York City with that accent. Do you know what my response to him was? And I'll end with this today. Well, good, because I want to work in Wichita, Kansas. <laughs> and he shut up and he left me alone. People told Reba McIntyre that all the time, too, to lose her accent coming from Oklahoma. But could you imagine Reba McIntyre without her accent? Could you imagine me without my accent? This is what makes me, me. And so I'm glad I never changed. And I was like, New York City, no thank you. I will take Wichita, Kansas any day. Thank you, guys.